So in this video, we're going to continue our voyage down the digestive tract, looking at the very last part of the digestive tract, that is the large intestine. So we've already looked at the mouth, the esophagus, the stomach, and the small intestine, and the accessory organs of the pancreas, liver, and gallbladder. So now we're ready to look and see what happens in the large intestine. Now the large intestine is divided into different parts. The part that where the small intestine is attached is called the cecum so you can see a little fragment of the small intestine here and so food or leftovers actually um, will enter into the large intestine the cecum travel up the ascending colon transverse colon descending colon sigmoid colon and then rectum and anus as it travels and then of course we'll get rid of it in our toilet now function of the large intestines, there are lots of different functions here listed. So we've got reabsorption of water, we have reabsorption of bile salts, absorption of electrolytes to help balance out our, elect our electrolytes, the calciums, the potassiums, um, sodiums, those types of things. It's also compact the intestinal contents to get it ready for um, elimination from our body. And then of course it's home to all kinds of bacteria. These bacteria are going to break down some of the organic molecules that we can't digest. So the indigestible carbohydrates, particularly those think of beans, um, that can, we, our enzymes can't break down, so the bacteria do instead. And, and as a result you can get flatus or gas. Uh, they, also the bacteria do give us some good things uh, that's including they produce vitamin K and biotin and vitamin B5 and those then the large intestine can absorb these vitamins to get them in circulation so that we can use them. And then the last thing of course the, the large intestine does is it gets and stores and eliminates the fecal material. Now a couple disorders related to the digestive um, or excuse me, to the large intestine, one of which is diverticulosis. Now diverticulosis is an outpocketing or herniations in the wall of the intestine. If you eat a diet that lacks bulk or lacks fiber, all that material, the fecal material that's in the in large intestine is really kind of soupy. It's almost um, think of it like pudding. And so if the intestine was trying to push that putting like fecal material along the digestive tract is just too squishy and so it has to contract harder to try to push it along and it simply can't and so that stress literally causes herniations and that's the diverticulosis or diverticula and you can see those in the picture here notice they're outpocketing these are not polyps in the colon these are outpocketing pushing out and you can get all these all throughout your intestine they tend to concentrate here on the descending colon, but um, you'll get them all along the colon and, and that of course is not good. If the if bacteria and other things in fecal material gets trapped inside those little diverticula, they can become inflamed and you can get inflammation and that inflammation is going to be called, called diverticulitis. Itis, remember, always refers to inflammation. And so this isn't good. So this is why you need a bulky diet or a diet high in fiber. It's easier for the intestines to push that stuff along. Another set of diseases are called inflammatory bowel diseases. These include Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And what happens, these, these there's a genetic uh, predisposition for these. But it's also related to our immune system. That is, we have an impairment of the immune system to be able to regulate an immune response. So your immune system often starts um, overreacting to the stuff that you have in the intestines and in the intestinal wall and starts to cause inflammation. And it's going to be a very serious disease and cause all kinds of problems. Uh, Crohn's disease is typically seen in the ascending colon and cecum somewhat scattered in the small intestine, mostly here, and then the sigmoid. Ulcerative colitis tends to concentrate only in the descending colon and uh, the sigmoid colon. So, and there's some other characteristics, but that's well beyond what we need to talk about now. Now to check these things out, to try to figure out what's happening, um, doctors will often do a colonoscopy. In a colonoscopy, you're looking on the inside of the intestine. So you stick a probe up the butt and look 
at and see how pretty your colon is. Now, not that colon doesn't normally look this pretty, nice and clean. Uh, you have to take a lot of uh, uh, liquid the night before um, to get rid of or all of the content in your large and small intestine. So it is nice and pretty and pink and clean for the doctor to look to see what's going on. Um, that's the worst part of the colonoscopy, if you ask me. Now, the um, what he's looking for are these little polyps. And you can also um, diagnose Crohn's or ulcerative colitis too, or diverticulosis. So you can check out a lot of different things. In this picture, he's looking at polyps. And so they can actually literally grab the polyp and pull them out. Now, if you have colon polyps, it doesn't automatically mean you have colon cancer, but sometimes those polyps can become cancerous. So it's a good thing to have a colonoscopy once in a while, particularly when you get up into your 50s. Um, now, if you have Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, sometimes the, the colon is so badly damaged, they simply have to either remove it, or I should include in this too, if you have colon cancer, they have to remove part of the colon or they want to give the colon a, a break, give it some rest um, so it can heal itself. So in either one of those cases, either removing it or allowing your colon to have a break to repair itself, they're going to do either colostomy or ileostomy, depending on the location. Um, and what they do is they just basically, for example, here, they'll cut this part of the descending colon away from the rest of it and then they take that end and kind of turn it inside out and they sew it into the wall of your abdominal cavity so that it protrudes out your belly and then so in other words the so that all the fecal material will travel along your colon here get to that and then come out this hole on your stomach and so you have to wear a colostomy bag um, to catch all of that fecal material that would be in that would be exiting out your, your colon. Um, and there's just a matter of location, if it's here or across the transverse. And it's called an ile ileostomy if they remove all of the colon or they uh, want to give all of the colon a break. And so they have the opening there on the ileostomy um, at the end of the small intestine. Uh, another thing then, of course, that the large intestines involved with is going to be in defecation. That's the fancy way to go in the bathroom. Um, having a bowel movement, you could say. So uh, things that are happening here, first of all, is peristaltic contractions are going to push the feces into the rectum. And so we get these wave actions of the muscles pushing the fecal material down here in the rectum. That's going to cause stretch receptors to stimulate further peristaltic contractions in the recti rectum, moving the feces towards the anus. Um, and that's more stretch receptors then send impulses up to the central nervous system and parasympathetic motor fibers then are going to be sent down. Now you have two sets of sphincter muscles. You have an involuntary um, sphincter here and, an, and is more of an internal sphincter. Oops, here's the internal sphincter. And then you have an external sphincter here. Now the internal sphincter is involuntary, whereas the external sphincter is voluntary. And so when the impulses come down through parasympathetic impulses, it's going to relax the internal sphincter. Again, remember that's involuntary, so it's going to be controlled by the parasympathetic nervous system. But we have conscious control over the external sphincter uh, and so that we can release the feces by relaxing the external sphincter when it's convenient for us to do so. Now, infants don't have that conscious control over the external sphincter until they become potty trained. So that's why um, they have they you know have to wear diapers. And that ends this section or this video uh, lecture of um, our trip through the small and large intestine. Uh, the next part that we'll be going on to then is going to be looking at the chemical digestion and absorption processes that occur along our digestive tract.